Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. The literal race of faith. Especially for those who've gone through so much. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance or weight and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who has endured such hostility by sinners against Himself, so that you will not grow weary, and lose heart. Amen. You may be seated. Remember from last week, the writer of Hebrews is saying, Let us consider, let us remember. That we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by those who gave up the ultimate. Their life. Gave up in service for Him. We're surrounded by these men and these women, if you will. They gave up much. They laid aside the weight. They laid aside. They learned to defeat, if you will, to overcome through the power of Christ the sin that so easily entangled them. And they run this race that was put before them and they, and they run it well. They run it well. For some, the race was longer than others but it still nonetheless was a race and, and, and they run it well in your life and in my life as we serve Christ it's a race a race that is put before us and our ultimate goal is to, is to run it well not for somebody to look upon us and say wow there's a mighty Christian but for someone to look upon Christ and say, Wow, He done a mighty work in that wretched soul's life. And to where Christ is elevated, to where Christ is lifted up. These men and women had to fix their eyes on Christ. So too do we had to fix their eyes on the one who was the author and the finisher of their faith. They had to fix, fix their eyes on Him as they endured the persecution at such a high level of Hebrews chapter 11 as we read it, as we read it in the past. And you can read it again yourself. And the persecution... The whippings, the slaughterings, the being left for dead, the suffering greatly. The writer says they had to fix their eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of their faith, the perfecter of their faith. Who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. He sits down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who has endured so much. For consider Him who has endured so much at the hands of sinful man. Yet He never grew weary. 
He never threw in the towel. He persevered perfectly for the Father. Turn to First Timothy, or I'm sorry, First Peter chapter one this morning. First Peter chapter one. I'm going to pick up a verse thirteen. You've heard me say it many times, the history of 1 Peter, the persecution of the believers. A key part of perseverance in the service for Christ. Listen, is your preparation. The key part of your perseverance is your preparation. You better have it. You set out to serve Christ, you better be prepared. You set out to persevere in service for Christ, you better be prepared. Verse 13, listen to what it says. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action. There wasn't a believer in Hebrews chapter 11 that didn't eventually learn this. Every believer in Hebrews chapter 11 had to learn this. Which was what? To prepare themselves. To prepare their minds for action. To prepare their minds for service. To prepare their minds for service in Christ. For Christ, for the glory of Christ. To renew their minds, right? Romans 12, 1 and 2. To learn a little bit of self control. To put all their hope, to fix their hope completely on the grace that is to be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. To understand that yes, this suffering that they had to endure that Peter's talking about here in First Peter, so too the, the believers in Hebrews chapter 11, they too had to endure a vast amount of suffering. But to understand, to remember, understand and to remember what? That the coming revelation of Jesus Christ was but around the corner. To fix their hope in Him. To fix their hope in the grace that He provided. To understand that, that this life was but, was but a mere vapor. It was fleeting. It was coming and it was going to go. And, and that's how your life is. Peter is reminding the persecuted believers of this and truth is it wouldn't be long it wouldn't be long before Peter would have to remind himself of this as he too would suffer martyrdom For the glorious revelation of Christ and who Christ is. Paul understood it well. Paul understood it. Many of those we read about in Scripture understood what it was, learned to what be, and to understand what it is to prepare their minds for service for Christ as they suffered so much for the glory of Christ the glory of Christ. You too and, and us in the area in which we live we, we don't suffer in that sense most of us. But you still have to prepare your mind daily in the service for Christ. To be as it says in verse 14 
To be as it says in verse 14 of 1 Peter chapter 1, obedient children. To be obedient. To not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. You must live as God's obedient children. This must happen in preparation in service for Christ. If you're going to prepare, or if you're going to persevere for Christ, you must prepare properly. There's enough P words there. You must prepare properly for Christ in order to persevere for Him. I can add another P word there at the back end, I guess. To persevere perfectly for Him. It must be what? It must be done. Prepare your minds, He says. As obedient children, to do not, not be conformed to your former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. To not be conformed to your old lifestyle. To live as obedient children. To not slip back into your old ways. To not feed. To not satisfy your old sinful desires. To not feed that, but feed that which glorifies Christ. To feed that which glorifies Him. that you didn't know any better then he's saying in verse 14 but now you do you didn't know any better then in your ignorance but now you do Peter saying there's no excuse is basically what he's saying if your worship of Christ is weak as a believer, there's really no excuse. If you treat the worship, the corporate worship of Christ as a, as a body of believers, if you treat it weak, if you treat it, take it or leave it, there's really no excuse, he's saying. You did those things in your ignorance before you come to faith. But now you really have no excuse. That's what he's saying at the end of verse 14. You didn't know better back then, but now you do. You didn't know better back then, but now you do. I mean, you would think Peter's, this letter would be, it is a letter of comfort, without a doubt but these people went through so much but Peter knows that you know you can only wrap the wounds and hug the neck so many times before what you must pick the child back up and say okay you must go back and face the world again and as a parent to a child and And here Peter's saying, I, I hug your neck, I, I wrap your wounds. I cry when you cry at the loss of loved ones for the service of Christ. But this isn't, this isn't going away. You must prepare yourself because this is going to continue the more you seek to live godly in this fallen sinful world. I can't continue to put powder on your bottom, if you will. You must what? Learn to live what? Learn to be what? Holy. But like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourselves. You 
must learn to live a life set apart for Christ. You must learn to run the race with perseverance. The race that is set before you with perseverance, you must learn to run that race. But in order to run that race, like I said, effectively, you must prepare your mind to do so. You must learn to live a sanctified life. You can't use the excuse, and you hear the excuse so many times, which is this, well, I live in a sinful flesh, and this is who I am, I'm human, I'm going to screw up, and it's just how it is. Paul shuts the door on that in Romans chapter 6. And they say, well, you talk about grace and mercy, well, I'll just go on living sinful lives and we'll just waller in grace and mercy. I'm all right with that, Paul. Paul says what? He says, God forbid that you even think of such a thing. We need to what? To push toward living holy lives. To persevere in living holy lives set apart for Christ. Because we don't know what's coming around the corner six months from now. The closer you draw to Christ, the easier it is to what? To withstand the persecution that might be coming. To withstand the whatever it is that's coming in your life that's going to be said to you that you do not want to hear. That's going to cut against the grain of what you think life should be like. There's so many people that that live their lives, so many believers that, and I don't know if they're believers or not, but I'm sure there is, and as, as well as people that aren't believers, but they live their lives in, with such anger, such displeasure in the Lord God because their life hasn't turned out the way they see that their life should turn out to be. They're so filled with a life bent on self but here Peter says your life for Christ is going to be tough but you must learn to cry out to him you must learn to serve him you must learn to live a sanctified life you must learn to be one in service for Him and Him alone. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, you address the Father as the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay here on earth. In other words, your Father here on earth, He has no, he has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. You must live with a fear of Him during your time here as sort of a temporary resident. He has no favorites. But you must learn to conduct yourself on this earth for your minimal stay, conduct yourself in a way that is honoring, that is lifting to Him, to Christ. In a way that lifts Him. Remember who Peter's talking to when he says this in verse 17. He says, listen, he says, your father plays no favorites. He'll judge you according to what you do, so you must live, what? In some sort of reverent fear during your time here as a temporary resident. Now for them that, and I'm sure there was that a few, I'd probably be one of them that jumped up and say, said, Peter, you don't understand what has just happened to us. We've lost so much. We've suffered so much. Our loved ones are gone. My friends are gone. I'm left with just a 
skeleton crew of family and loved ones or, or they're all gone and it's just me, Peter. Peter says, I want you to live a holy life and sanctified, set apart unto Him. Remember the one you're serving. He has no favorites. And He will reward you. He's going to reward you according to what you do. He's going to reward you. But you must live here on earth as a temporary resident in honor and service for Him. No matter how bad it gets, you must live here as a servant of Him until He calls you home. In Hebrews chapter 12, oh, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, men and women that have come before us. They have served Him well while here on earth as a temporary resident that served them well in their time here on earth. That when their race was all done, that when their race was over, they would hear what? Well done. My good in my faithful servant. When you serve Christ, you serve Christ to glorify Christ, to worship Christ, not for the accolades of man. Remember that. And I know you say, well, I understand that, but, but the problem is, in our humanness, is what? We like pats on the back, don't we? We all do. We all do. But in our race for Christ, if all we seek is pats on the back from man, then that's all we get. Our desire should be that when we're all done, when we've breathed our last, when we know it's about to come to the end, that we can say in our minds, that which the Lord has blessed me with, that I gave a portion back to Him. That the Lord has given me as a gift and service for Him. That I did well for Him. I did it well no matter how bad the persecution was. I served Him well. I learned. Because I was surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses before me that learned well too. And I learned from them and watch their steps, watch their lives, their rights, their wrongs. Oh, they served oh so well. And that's what I longed to do was serve oh so well. Because what? Because we're not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from our futile way of life inherited from our forefathers in verse 18 but what it's not pay with mere gold and silver or redemption gold and silver what lose their value don't they I just read yesterday gold's up to two thousand dollars an ounce and for some reason, I find an interest in that and keep an eye on it, and it's back up. It's up and down. It, it loses its value. Peter's saying gold and silver lose their value, but it's the precious blood of what? He says in verse 19. But the precious blood of the Lamb that's unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. You're redeemed through what He has done. 
You're redeemed through what Christ has done. Paul says, let us remember, or the writer Peter says, let us remember what Christ has done. We're redeemed through what He has done. The great cloud of witnesses mentioned back in Hebrews 12 and Hebrews 11 They're not redeemed through what they did. They're redeemed through what Christ has done. Remember? 2,000 years after Abraham, Christ, in His incarnation, 1400 years after Moses Christ and his incarnation but yet before these two men Christ Christ we're redeemed by what he's done not what we've done If we're running the race in our own strength, we don't even get off the, the gate. We don't even get out of the gate. We're like the stumbling horses that come running out of the gate and fall over each other. We don't even make it. We don't even get out to a sprint. We wouldn't even make it but mere inches. And that would be because our momentum took us forward. But we serve the Christ. We serve the Christ, the Messiah. We look to Him who spilled His blood as a lamb unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. For He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Remember what I just said. Before Abraham, Christ. Before Moses, before the foundations of the world, He has appeared in these last times for the sake of what? Before the, for the sake of you and for the sake of me. Peter to the readers is saying this. He say, I know what you've gone through. I know what you endured. I know the struggles. But let us persevere for Christ. Let us persevere through Christ. Who through Him are the believers in God. Who, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory. So that your faith and hope are in what? Christ. See, it's through Christ you come to trust in the Lord God. You place your faith and your hope in Christ. Because he's raised from the dead, given great glory. You're cleansed from your sins because of what? Because of Christ and your obedience to the truth. It's all of Christ, it's all of the Lord, it's all of Him. The writer's saying, listen. As you persevere, as you run this race, continue to persevere for the glory of Christ. It's not easy. It's always easy to quit, isn't it? It's always easy to quit. It's always easy to say, well, you know, I don't think I want to do this next year. Or I don't want to think I want to do this six months from now or next month. I got this to do. I got that to do. I'm, I'm going to go that direction or this direction. And I'm going to do that. It's, it's an easy way out. You know, if, if there's not another area for you, we, me and Tina have talked about this. We've talked about this in church before. If there's not another area for you to go and serve Him in, then that's a pretty good indicator that you don't need to be stopping serving Him where you're at now. It doesn't open the door for anything else. Peter says in verse 23 as a word of encouragement, 
You've been born again. Not of the seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring Word of God. He says, listen. For you've been born again, but not to this life that will quickly end. Peter's saying, listen, this life's going to end. In other words, what? If you die by the sword, it's going to end. Right? If you lose your head, it's going to end. If you get strapped to the back of a horse to a 20-foot rope and drug down an old, dusty, rocky road, okay, it's going to hurt, but it's going to end. If you live a good long life to 90 years old and die that way, it's going to end. We all go through the same portal of death. But he says, let me give you a little bit of encouragement here. No matter how you leave here, your new life in Him goes on eternal because of what? Because of what He has done. In other words, to the writer, to the readers in 1 Peter, do not focus so much on this life which is going to what? End. Because if you leave long enough and the Lord tarries, you're going to go through the door of death. No matter how you flip it. So to shut the door, so to shut the door on those that were saying, you know, I'm 25 years old, I'm suffering so much. I'm 35, I'm suffering so much. And my child of 15 lost his or her life for the cause of Christ and were scattered throughout. We don't understand, Peter. We don't understand why this happened to us and at our age or however you want to word it. Peter says this. Consider this. We're like grass. <laughs> I mean, you can see some of Peter's so much love in this guy, okay, for believers. But you can see that at times when he had to get right to the point, he did. He's reminding the believers that have suffered so much persecution, he says this, we're like grass. Beauty is like a flower in the field. Grass withers, the flowers fade. But the words of the Lord remain forever. Peter says, listen. My life and your life is like grass. Your life and my life here this morning is like grass. Flowers in the field. Here in, here in four months, short four months, the green, the grass will start to green. The wild flowers in the field will start to grow. And then they'll fade months later. Peter says our lives are like grass and flowers in the field. Grass withers, the flower fades. He says, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The words of the Lord remain forever. But the word of the Lord endures forever. What's he saying? He said, listen. The words of the Lord says what? For by grace are you saved through faith. Eternal life is faith. This is, these are the literal words of the Redeemer of the world. He says to us, as Peter saying to the writer, to the readers, is this. The Lord God says to us, has said to us, that if you believe in my Son, in His perfect life, in His dying on the cross, in His resurrection, you will have eternal life, Peter says. Consider that. And not to consider what? How your life is going today. 
you and me, may we consider Christ as we serve Him. May we consider Him. As we live our lives, may we consider Him. And not consider so much how our lives are going today. May we consider the One who proved who He was by living a perfect life life you see you just can't tell somebody you, know, you hear somebody say a little child will say well, I'm, believe, I, I'm saved because I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again and, 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 of course but if that's all that needed to happen if you will. Remember, his life was perfect. He proved who he was. Let's not forget that when we tell people about Christ. That Christ proved who he was. By, by living a perfect life. I remember listening to R.C. Sproul one time on that subject. And Sproul said, Sproul said, you know, if that's all, if, if that's all he had to do was down on the cross, well, he could have just went to the cross. He said, but he lived a perfect life. And Sproul, of course, had some fancy word to add to the perfect life, not me. I'll just say to prove who he was. Peter says, when you run this race, you run this race in service for Him. You persevere for Him. When it's all said and done, He's saying, make sure that you run your race. You finish your course for His glory and for His honor. Somebody says, and you've heard this passage of Scripture in the past, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. I'm already being poured out as an offering. The time of my departure is at hand. You know, when you serve Christ, you you're serving Christ, you're heading towards what? Your time of departure. To fly out of here. Paul says, I, this is to Timothy, I fought the good fight. In other words, I fought the good fight. Now it's, it's your turn. They fought the good fight. Now it's, now it's our turn, right? They were surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Hebrews chapter 12. We're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, men and women before us. I fought the good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Timothy, it's, it's handed to you. You take it and go. You don't focus on the persecution as Peter said to the believers that were scattered throughout the land. But you focus on the crown that is waiting before you. The crown of righteousness which the righteous judge the Lord will award. Remember, it just mentioned something similar in 1 Peter chapter 1. We just got done reading that on that day. Paul says, it's not only going to come to me. But it's going to come also to all who love Him. Who love His appearing. It comes to all. Pray in your race for Christ. That when you realize that your course is up, that when you realize that when you can see the finish line, if you will, 
that you truly can sit back and say, I have fought my fight. I run my race. And whether you leave out of here by the edge of the sword, or whether you leave out of here in a bed in a hospital, I pray that we all can truly and honestly say we finished our course. We fought our fight. We persevered. We prepared properly. And we left. We left men and women behind us to carry on. To carry on the service of Christ. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we, we love you, Lord, and thank you and praise you and glorify you for, for who you are. We're only able to persevere through you we're only able to prepare our minds through you. May we do it well. It's to you goes the glory and the honor and the praise. It's to you we love. We thank you. We thank you for this day of worship. Thank you for those who made it here this morning. Father, and as we fellowship a little time this morning today Lord God this afternoon we ask for a blessing over the food Lord a blessing over the fellowship time may this food nourish our bodies may you be exalted may you be magnified this upcoming week it's in your name we give thanks and pray Amen